summer. So um, for those of you who missed, I'm a second year student at California School of Podiatric Medicine. I actually founded this page with the idea to just bring more awareness about podiatric medicine as a field. So I didn't even learn about it until I was in my gap year. I actually took two gap years um, and I was advising. So I got assigned to advise for podiatric medicine and I started to shadow a podiatrist and I learned all about the field and all it entails. And I, I was just wondering why people don't know about this until they fall into it or um, you know, maybe they have a family member that was a part of it. But for someone like me, like I'm a, I'm a first generation in this country, so it's really hard. So um, I think it's really important um, for other people to know that this is a field and how easy it is to help people um, in this profession and how much flexibility there is. So not only like something that's really important to me is serving the underserved population. So you can do something as simple as cutting someone's toenails and they're able to walk. And then you can even continue their care where you're able to take them into surgery and then follow them after that. So I don't know, it's just a field that I think everyone should learn about um, or at least be aware of. Um, I think people know about MD, DOs had some trouble, um, but now they're kind of at the same level. I want DPMs to also be at that level as well. So I think we're a hidden gem, um, like Dr. Kamara said last week. So uh, last but not least, so I want to... I don't want to take the spotlight today. We have a very, very awesome person coming on. Her, she's a third year resident, so she's about to get out into the world right now, but she's been making boss moves before then, way before then. So um, she has an account going right now. That's the, the Many Things account. So that's the giveaway that's going on right now. Um, and she also has a program that she's gonna tell us more about later on in the segment. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and bring her on. Let's see. All right. So Dr. Katarina is coming up soon. There Hello. She is. How's it going? Good. Can you hear me okay? I'm kind of like, I have my phone stacked on a whole big pile of books, so. Yeah, yeah, we can hear you fine. Okay, awesome. I have a special guest. I want everyone to say hi to oh, Tina. Hi. She's super excited to join us on the go live. So thank you for having me today. Yeah, no problem. So um, tell us a little bit about yourself. Where are you doing your residency? How's it been going? Yeah, uh, so born and raised in Chicago. Uh, my parents are Greek. My dad is a Greek immigrant who came from Greece. My mom was born here. Her family is also Greek. Um, I've been in Chicago my whole life. I did my undergrad at Loyola University where I majored in biology, minored in psychology, and then I went to Shoal for school. And now I'm doing my residency at Loyola Medical Center that's also associated with Edward Hines VA. And I'm a third year resident right now. Um, so things are going well. Uh, third year's going by way too quickly than I imagined, um, yeah. which is a good and bad thing because, you know, I love the people that I work with, but I'm also kind of ready to go on to the next chapter of my life. Um, overall, my experience has been really good. And uh, I'm excited to talk more about podiatry and answer any questions that you guys have. All right. That's awesome. I'm really excited to see how everything's going to turn out. There yeah. No doubts. Um, uh, so tell us a little bit about your, your experience while you were in school. Yeah. Um, so to go back a little bit, I had no idea what podiatry was at all uh, when I was an undergrad. And I had done the pre-med track the entire time that I was at Loyola undergrad. And I had already started my MDDO applications. I took a year off after school to do those applications. And then in the middle of that, I was also studying for the MCAT because I knew essentially while my applications were going on for MDDO, I was going to take two years off, um, one year to apply, study for the MCAT, and the additional year to, you know, interview and everything like that. So I would say six months into my break after school and my leap year, I found out about podiatry through a friend's mom who just so mm -hmm. happened to mention that her son was applying to podiatry school. And I was like, what do you mean podiatry school? I don't know, like, what Yeah, that like, means. what is that? What is yeah, that she was like, oh, yeah. he wants to be a podiatrist. Yeah. So I was like, okay, but like what med school, like I don't get it, like podiatry, I was like, don't you have to take boards and then you get, you know, qualified to do a certain yeah. special thing? She's like, no, this is like dental school where you go in knowing that you're going to be like a foot doctor essentially. And I right. was like, how did I not know about this throughout my entire pre-med track at Loyola? So 
I looked into it and it had a lot of the things that I wanted in my checklist. I wanted to do surgery. I wanted good life balance. I wanted to do something specialized. And so I looked into it. I shadowed a couple doctors that I absolutely yeah. fell in love with everything they did. And I was like, I felt okay, like that's the game sign changer. Me like shadowing people is the oh, game changer. 100%. Like you're not sure people say foot doctor. I don't know what that means. And then you start shadowing and you're like, whoa, <laughs> this is, this is what I think a doctor should do. Um, Absolutely. And it back then, I mean, I sound like this was 50 years ago, but it was only like what seven or so. Uh, when I was first starting to look for like different resources online, there were very limited videos on YouTube. There were, Instagram wasn't even like a huge thing back then where people had all these accounts and there's all these resources. And I was like scavenging to find any information or like personal information from like different people's experiences and like clinicians, residents, students from podiatry right. that I could not find anything. So yeah. um, I think what you're doing and what your a group is doing, PodMed Adventures is so important. The interviewing, the bringing podiatry into like the social media space, I think is huge. And that's basically my attempt um, when I started at Kettering a DPM on Instagram was to promote podiatry now now I'm seeing like this influx of people that are doing it and that's just so amazing because the more of us that are out there kind of advocating for our field I yeah. think it's gonna especially like the younger generation the people that are students residents you know pre-med students can relate more to students that are kind of like in their generation so I think it's an amazing thing um, so yeah. I liked what you know the doctors that I shadow did and then afterwards right. I was like okay sign me up and then I pretty much put the MDDO applications on the back burner and then I went full DPM and I interviewed, I got in and I was like, all right, well, the rest of it is history. Like I'm, I'm going to be a podiatrist. Yeah. And yeah. to this day, I am super excited for what I picked. Um, I really do yeah. think that things happen for a reason. I ran into this woman for a reason. That lady basically changed the course of my life. Um, right. I really, and as most people, like, just to kind of chime in, as more people, if you have any questions, someone, some people are starting to post their questions, go ahead and post the questions. And then at the end, we're going to go ahead and answer those. So just, just as you're talking, and sorry to interrupt, I just want to let people Oh my God, no if, problem. Yeah, if they have any questions. And kind of going on to like, we're in the thick of it right now. It's second year. It's the struggle is real. So do you, you know, could you speak to, to any struggles that you went through okay, in school like, or in the oh, process? Oh, absolutely. Um, to be honest, and I'm only speaking from my experience because that's the only experience I know, school was the hardest part. A hundred percent hands down. Residency is hands on. You learn more of like what interests you. Um, the patient interaction is just so valuable that there's just the hours are long. The hours are very long. It's a very yeah. demanding schedule, but it's all worth it. And school sucked for me. Like I'm, I'm going to be very blatantly and honest with you that I lost who I was at school. I feel yeah. like people completely underestimate the challenges of podiatric medical school compared to other schools yeah um the yeah. I feel like it was I mean I thought it was going to be easier because we were already going to in this into a specialty and then I got in and it's like oh you need to know everything they need to know and Plus, your specialty I was like right okay, cool you know we'll do this yeah which is important because I feel like sometimes podiatry medical or podiatric medical schools marketed as like specialized like medical school for foot and ankle but the way i think it should be explained is it's medical school full body anatomy you learn mm -hmm. everything that they do in addition to you learn more specialized courses about foot and ankle yeah um so you're a doctor but you're also specializing in something earlier on um we at shoal we are also affiliated with um chicago medical school so we had some courses with the md students as well okay. and the md track is so different from the dpm track the md track they have cumulative exams where they basically have one or two exams a month okay. um, that highlight all the subjects that they're studying all in one exam us we had two to three exams a week so i was not yeah. the type of person that was studying for every exam every day like i was a professional crammer by the end of my podiatry career at school. Um, I was studying nonstop. It was just like this endless loop of going to the library, going to school, yeah. going home to eat, going to the library, going home. It's for two years. Yeah. At, at, like after the second year, I was like, I can't do this anymore. Like I need a change of something. So thank God we got into our capstone where our course is a little bit different where our third year we have like block 
capstones where we have like a radiology capstone, general surgery or just surgery, you know, about mechanics. Those are more like, like more hands-on rotations or like, or, um, or like what, how would you? It, it was just more uh, focused to that one particular subject. So every day okay. you had reading for that particular subject versus like going home and having like a million things to do for other classes. So it was a little bit more yeah. specialized. So your studying was more focused. And that was basically the way I studied, you know. I was a professional crammer, like I said. There were days that I had one night to study for an exam, two nights. And wow. there were other people that were able to study for every exam every day. And, like, yeah. my brain didn't function like that. So I was completely burnt out. I felt like, oh, my gosh, is this what I signed up for? But then at the same time, like, I would see people that had graduated. I'd see attendings come in and do lectures and residents and come do lectures. And there was always this sense of there's light at the end of the tunnel. Like, keep going. Like, this is the worst part. Just keep yeah. going through it. And that's 100% true. From my perspective, school is just something that you just get through. And if you can get through school, you can get through anything. Um, just think about it at the end of the day. Do you want to wear this white coat? Do you want to help people? Do you want to be the doctor that you always aspire to be? And if the answer is yes to all three of those, just put your head down, focus. You may lose your identity. I don't know. <laughs> Me, I yeah. had no hobbies in school. I, know, I didn't know yeah. who I was. I didn't know what I liked anymore. I was just yeah. like this piece of so particles like if you could I was basically go... <laughs> yeah go ahead sorry I'm if, if you, you could go back um and tell yourself no. something on your first day oh. of a podiatry school what what piece of advice would you give to yourself don't overthink everything I tend to overthink a lot of things you'll yeah. go crazy if you sit there and overthink it just the all you can do is try your best you try your best you execute what you can do and then you move on if you don't do well on, a, on an exam don't dwell on it the exam is done the grade is in like move on you have to be resilient um yeah and you can't let an exam score you can't let a class you can't let a classmate you can't let an opinion of a, a professor mm -hmm. define you i mean you are yeah. more than a student you are more than an exam you're more than hey. a number <laughs> And yeah. I feel like if I knew that day one, if I, if I could go back, I would tell myself, you're going to graduate regardless. You're going to get into a residency regardless. You're going to become a doctor regardless. Obviously, okay. you have to get good grades. You have to pass your classes. But our class in particular was very competitive. There were brilliant people in my class. Um, yeah. We had a lot of like high you know, score averages. <laughs> So there was a lot of competition. There was a lot to kind of like work towards. And it was nice to be surrounded by all these brilliant people because they yeah. constantly were pushing each other, like studying yeah. together. And like, you really want to motivate yourself and surround yourself with people yeah. that motivate each other. But it's going to be okay. You got to yeah. see, you got to be, you get whatever, like, don't let that stop you. Every day is a new day. Just focus on what you have to do. It's going to get better. Um, if I so was with told, all of, Katarina, the, all of those exams, like coming at you like first year second year and like you know having three or four exams how did you how are you able to pull all of that together and prep for boards and and do well on that because I feel like that's a huge concern that a lot of us are oh, having yeah. for sure um so when it came to like going over material and there was a lot of material in a short amount of time yeah I my study habits towards the end Basically, I was like reading the material PowerPoints. I was rereading, um, re-listening to the lectures and everything. And I would just make outlines for myself. And I would basically read the outlines over and over and over again. And that's all I did because I didn't have that much time to really do anything more. Um, okay. Listening to the lectures again. Like I said, I studied from exam to exam to exam. So yeah. time management, I didn't have like, oh, from one to two, I'm going to do biochemistry. From two to yeah. three, I was like, no, all day we're doing biochemistry. We're going to get this test over with. And then, you know, okay. tomorrow, once the test is done, then I'm going to start radiology or something like that. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure a lot of people go through that same kind of schedule because we're human. We can I only do. retain so I much do. information. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. what they expect us to have like these like bionic minds of like oh we're just gonna flood them with all this information and like hope they can retain all of it no at least yeah. for me it was like very test to test um and then when it came to boards you know you'll be surprised how much you can learn and retain from all the classes that you took and um you know definitely you have to brush up on a lot of things but even for boards like part one we had a whole week before boards and i basically studied for that whole week okay. um for boards part two it's different because you're also studying for interviews as well so that definitely yeah. helps when it comes to boards um okay. by studying for both at the same time um so take it step by step you know a lot of people just 
over flood their minds thinking, oh my God, I have this and then I have this and I have to do that. And it, it's true. You have and all then, that on your checklist, yeah. but you have to separate it from, okay, what can I, what is reasonable for me to do today? Right. Um, and then is it kind of like, yeah. Stepping from passing boards, how did you, how are you able to decide what residency is going to work best for me? Like, did you use the location aspect being closer to home or what helped you decide? Cause there's so many out there. Um, oh yeah. yeah. Um, so my experience was that was different. Um, so at, uh, at the time I was dating somebody who was in my class who hated Chicago, who did not like Chicago, didn't want to be here, didn't want to discuss being here. I love Chicago. My family's here. My life is yeah. here. I wanted to stay here. Um, right. But this person was kind of like putting all these ideas in my head that's like, you're so boring that you're here your whole life and you want to stay here. Like, go out, do something different, branch out, do out-of-state rotations, learn something new, see something different. And that, <laughs> okay. and that idea got to my head, and I was like, yeah. maybe he's right. Maybe I should do this. I, I don't know. Like, I have been yeah. here my whole life. Yes, that's true. So then, you know, it, it came time to picking my rotations, and I picked rotations in Florida, Kentucky, Indiana, Colorado. I did maybe two oh, here and yeah. And then at the end towards like right before interviews, I was like, I want to stay in Chicago. So yeah. my piece of advice is pick rotations that you want to go to location wise and that you feel like you would fit. Um, when it comes to residency, I, you know, had like the cores to pick from that I had from Shoal, from Shoal that we had certain cores at certain hospitals here in Chicago. So I was lucky to have that. And then right. I picked one here myself go somewhere where you can be yourself um where you, you know you can see yourself in both challenging and and in fun situations um yeah. when i rotated through loyola university that was also associated with heinz so basically we did our rotation at heinz the va um uh -huh. there was like a an element of like family there like the, all the residents got along the attendings were always there to kind yeah. of um guide the residents and at loyola you know, it's a little bit different than Heinz. Heinz is very resident run. The clinics okay. are resident run. We so have a lot more between... autonomy as far as oh like my what god, do. absolutely. So uh, resident run clinics. Sometimes we have seventy to eighty patients a day from the morning to the afternoon. It's yeah. insane. I mean, it's a very busy <laughs> clinic. Um, there's a but lot of a autonomy. lot of hands on exposure too. Oh, You're probably totally. like feeling super comfortable getting out there now. Absolutely. Go somewhere where you have both clinic, clinical experience and surgical experience. Okay. Um, go somewhere where you're comfortable, where you can see yourself, where you have support and where they have resources for you to do what you want to do in residency. Are you interested in research? Is this an academic facility that will provide the resources that you need to do research? Um, if you are interested in wound care, obviously you want to go somewhere where they have like a wound care clinic, where they have all the resources. Right. Um, tailor what you want and kind of pick and choose what you want in a residency and definitely go somewhere where they have those resources for them to provide you. But then I think the number one thing is make sure that you can adapt well to the culture and that you can be yourself. Thank All you my co-residents know yeah. I'm a little bit like on the just like crazy side. So like they accept that for who I am, you know, they know right. like I'm going to crack a joke. They know my sense of humor. Um, right. There's a really good balance between our residency. So definitely go somewhere where you can just see yourself fit personally and then make sure that they have the resources that you need. So for speaking more about your residency, could you tell us a little bit more about your residency program in particular and how that maybe fits into what you want to do once you get out and how well your program prepared you for that? Yeah, absolutely. That's a good question. Um, so I really like my program because it's almost like two separate worlds. You have the veteran side with the VA hospital, which is very resident run. There's a lot of autonomy. Um, yeah. There's a lot of pathology, a lot of sick patients at the VA, like the VA population yeah. in general is very sick population. Right. Um, and then you also have the Loyola side, which is like a private academic facility, um, mm -hmm. a little bit more of elective cases that come through there. Uh, Loyola okay. is a level one trauma center. So we get a lot of trauma, gunshot wounds, crush injuries, you name it. We hit, we see all of it. Um, so I think the okay. balance between, yeah. So I think yeah. the balance between <laughs> Is really I mean, good. I'm trying to be not excited because that sucks for the person, but that's a lot of. Really yeah, I injuries. mean, exactly. You need to be well equipped to kind of go into the real world knowing, okay, I've seen this. I know what to do. I know how to manage this. Yeah. Um, what I really appreciate about the veteran side, the Heinz VA, is the fact that it is resident run. Um, yeah. But we also have 
like our clinics are very organized. We have like a biomechanical clinic where we um, cast uh, patients for like orthotics. Then we have another PAVE clinic, which is like a high risk diabetic care clinic for patients that have previous ulcerations, previous amputations. It's more like a high risk screening. And then we have another clinic that's graft clinic, which is strictly wound care clinic. And the resident gets to pick which wound product we use, how to debride, if they need surgical mm -hmm. intervention. Like it's yeah. such a good balance between more of like the academic facility um, that's more like attending decision based run at Loyola. And then you get to learn all that and kind of practice that at Heinz. Um, yeah. moving forward, the amount of limb salvage that I've seen, the amount of, uh, diabetic care and wound care that I've seen has really like sparked my interest to kind of pursue that path. Okay. Um, we've definitely seen so many, cases of like INDs, amputation, surgical emergencies that are related to like the foot and ankle where it's more like diabetic care based that that's what I want to eventually um, focus on in my career. So yeah. that will equip me to kind of be more comfortable in that space because um, in the future, what I am doing next year, and I don't think I've uh, mentioned this on Instagram yet, is I'm doing a fellowship at UT Southwestern where it's Whoa. gonna be under the yeah. I'm like so oh excited about this. Yeah, the other the, uh, it's gonna be in Dallas, Dallas so I'm finally like Texas. Chicago. Like yeah, <laughs> maybe it's meant to be for me to leave for a year, but I'm going to UT Southwestern. Um, the fellowship director is Dr. Lavery, who's very well known in the wow. diabetic foot and ankle. Um, That's amazing! Congratulations! Based. Yeah, thank you so much. So I'm very excited about that. Uh, that program focuses on diabetic limb salvage, wound care. It's under the plastic surgery umbrella at that hospital. So you will be doing like a lot of muscle flaps, skin flaps, grafts, stuff like that. So I'm yeah. beyond stoked. Um, so I really do feel like Heinz and the Loyola uh, program definitely prepared me for that kind of fellowship. And I'm, I'm so excited to just learn more and really focus my career on more of like the diabetic limb salvage and wound care, more like yeah. hospitalist uh, podiatry. Um, I really like INDs. I really like surgical emergencies and like, I love all that stuff. So I felt like because I like such a particular focus in podiatric medicine and surgery, I felt like it was in my best interest to pursue fellowship. Right. And like, so it sounds like you have a lot of things going on, um, but you're able to manage all that and sneak yeah. in a business. So how, how did you do that? Like, how does that all So work? I really feel, so one thing I read one day, it was really interesting. I read somewhere that people with anxiety put, some people cope with anxiety by putting more on their plate. And I was just like, do I have anxiety? Like, yeah, every, everyone's anxious. But, and then I realized that all this stuff that I kind of started was during the time that I had gone through like a messy breakup where mm -hmm. I was like contemplating doing muddy pens, where I was contemplating, you know, spreading sulfate. I just kind of occupied my mind somewhere else. And yeah. I developed an interest for all this stuff. And I feel like so many people just kind of get focused in their careers and they only do podiatry and they only do clinic and they only do surgery and then they go home and they go back to their work and they, and go they home. rinse and repeat. <laughs> yeah. Rinse and repeat. Yeah. And then yeah. I was doing that the first year of residency. And I was like, of course, residency is really hard to transition into. I mean, you're thrown into the real world. This is real patients. These are real interactions. These are real medical decisions that are going to impact the lives of other people. So the yeah. transition was, you know, it was smooth, but it was like, it took a lot of time for you to get very comfortable. So the yeah. first year of residency was very much like my schedule at school, go to the hospital, go home, go to the hospital, go home, do something mm -hmm. fun on the weekend when you're not on call, go to the hospital, go home. And then after the first year, I realized, like, oh, my God, I'm doing the same thing that I did during school. I'm yeah. living the same kind of schedule. Like, I need to branch out and do something different for my own sanity, for my yeah. own identity. Because at that point, I'm still like, what do I like in life besides podiatry? Like, I need to find <laughs> other things. And, like, everyone was telling me, they're like, what do – if somebody asked me during residency, like, what are your hobbies? I'd be like, um, I like to go to Chipotle <laughs> it, and – I don't know. I like blaze pizza. That like, so I don't fun. know. What are my hobbies? I go to work every day and I come back and I go to Dunkin Donuts. Like, what do I do? <laughs> so I realized very soon enough that like school had made me the boringest person that I ever became in my life. Like I became boring at school. I didn't do anything at school. And then first year residency came in and I was like transitioning into like this, you know, more adult life and yeah. in my profession. And then second year comes along and I'm like, okay, I am more 
transitioned into residency. I want to do something more. Um, so to go back, uh, many things all started because of SoulFit. Okay. So rewind back to so second yeah, year tell of us about school. Soul yeah, yeah. A lot let's, of let's things are like, like let us know. So a lot of things in my life are like cascade events. One thing happens, then it leads to the other, then it leads to the other, and then it just comes full circle. Okay, right. so. I, and I want to share my story because I feel like so many people have reached out to me on Instagram and they're just like, hey, I'm a podiatry student, I'm a podiatry resident, but I also want to do this in my life. Do you think it's feasible? Yes. The answer is always yes. Yeah. If you want to do something more, do it. I mean, now is the time. You are young. You have the resources mm -hmm. that you need. Just do whatever you have to do to like fulfill this this need in your life. Yeah. Um, sorry, sidetrack. So go back to rewind to second year of podiatry school. I applied for the scholarship at school called the Franklin Fellowship, mm -hmm. and essentially that's a fellowship uh, scholarship that basically gives the winners that there's 12 people that get picked every year from the entire school. And that's like the MD program, DPM, pharmacy, all the programs at my school, 12 uh -huh. students get picked and they give $500 to each student to jumpstart like their own research or um, community service project. Okay. So I was in clinic one day and uh, there was this little boy that we saw that was complaining about toe pain. And we soon came to find out that his shoes were two sizes too small. Okay. So from that day, this was like three days after I had gotten that email to um, um, sign up for that scholarship. And I came up with it, this idea of we're a podiatric medical school. We provide care for patients in our clinic that is associated mm -hmm. with our school. Like, wouldn't it be cool if we can raise money and provide shoes for students in need? And my school was in a, a community that was uh, lower income families, um, the society mm -hmm. like around, if you looked at the statistics for the schools, like 10% of the students at elementary schools, if you look at um, their statistics were listed as homeless. Um, so then I was just like, why don't we just raise money and buy shoes for kids in need? So right. then I was like researching and then I found this international or this national program called mm -hmm. Shoes That Fit and I reached out to them and I said, hey, I'm a podiatry student. I really want to start a community service project at my school. Do you want to work together and kind of collaborate? And maybe we can become chapters of your organization and we can slowly spread them to the different schools. And they were all about it. They're like, it makes no, sense. Yeah, that, that makes our a lot organ of sense. Like, why yeah. not? Yeah. Yeah. So they were like super excited. They're like, it makes sense that podiatry and our, like our, organization should merge so we can better provide for children in our community so then it kind of started getting momentum at shoal and it still is doing great today we're doing distribution events every year providing shoes for kids in need and eventually the goal is to spread it to the, all the podiatric medical schools kent okay. state is doing a phenomenal job um doing fundraising and um raising money and providing shoes for kids in need in their community and they're doing amazing fundraisers like dodgeball tournaments they did like this art auction show oh i'm so God. impressed with like, so fun stuff it's yeah fun, it's for, fun stuff that people. yeah yeah it one thing okay so i can talk about soul fit for hours but three <laughs> main things that i feel like are really important about soul fit number one you provide for sh shoes for kids in need. These kids are wearing tight shoes. They don't want to be in school because their feet hurt. They don't want right. to engage in gym class. They don't want to play with their friends. Um, then if you look at the statistics of Soul Fit, that's a part of like Shoes That Fit. Shoes That Fit does statistics where it shows that um, this amount of percentage of kids with ill-fit shoes don't engage in gym class, don't go to school. There's a higher population of students with like ripped shoes that get more targeted for bullying. So there's a whole social yeah. aspect that goes behind wearing tight shoes or shoes that have holes and stuff like that. So there's so much more than just providing just shoes for kids. Right. You're providing, you know, more comfort for them to be in an environment where they can learn, where they can just be more comfortable being themselves at school. Right. Um, and they're not just, you know, ridiculed by other students. Oh, why are you shoe your shoes so, you yeah. know, so dirty and stuff like, like that. that? You're just, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So like it, those distribution events like definitely changed my life. I, I love going to these yeah. events. We're providing shoes for kids in need. So it's important to provide. So number one is to provide shoes for kids in need. Number two, we always talk about a profession to elementary school kids. Um, we give them the word podiatry and we bring it to their kind of perspective and we bring that word into like their mind saying we are doctors that basically help
treat foot and ankle. And we give them like, we basically bring podiatry and part of like their medical vocabulary. And one day maybe these kids want to grow up to be podiatrists because maybe, you know, they'll think a podiatrist came to my school when I was in fourth grade and they provided shoes for, for me when I really needed them. Um, yeah. And then another thing, third, we're getting more exposure publicly of the community service that podiatric physicians, students, residents can all kind of partake in the community because it's one thing going on social media and saying podiatry is a hidden gem and like that, that's what we all do that's what right. we all say because it is a lot of people don't know about it yeah um but i think social outreach i think making it's an impact the and, most important thing yeah yeah and i, I think, feel like yeah yeah go for it yeah well no i'm gonna go ahead and just if you want to like wrap up with soul fit because i was gonna say we're gonna have uh links to all of these resources that if you want to start this at your school or if this is something you want to get involved in um yeah. we are gonna have this um on our link tree in our bio so um yeah that's sorry i'm like rambling yeah. about this so no, no i no, can no, go on okay. for hours about it um oh. but then the last thing i wanted to say is um that by providing community outreach like our story our first distribution event was featured in like the chicago like this chicago tribune so by doing social outreach by hosting workshops for like pre-med students and undergrad universities by doing work that provides for other people by getting podiatry out there through helping others i think will have a higher impact of kind of getting the word out there about our profession um, so then long story short, I started a pin, I designed a pin and I was selling the Soulfit pin for our Soulfit organization at school and that caught on at Shoal. And then somebody was like, these pins are so cute. Like, why don't you make other ones? And I was like, yeah, that'd be cool. So I kind of played around with the idea of starting like a, an Etsy shop where I sell medical themed pins. I was thinking about that idea probably for like eight months. And then last November, I was like, I'm just going to make a shop. I'm just going to put some pins up. And then I'm just yeah. going to sell them. And then it's been my hobby ever since. So, That's you know, one awesome. thing leads so to the other that leads to the other. for a reason. And 100%. you don't question it. And you just ride the wave. And it'll all be okay. <laughs> yeah. And I ask people, I'm like, should I do this? And they're like, no, you don't have time. No, you don't know anything about business. No. And then I, I second guess myself, you know. Yeah. So if you want to do something, don't ask other people. You know intrinsically if you want to do something or not. So just do it. Like, you know your potential. And if you have the self-awareness to know, yeah, I can handle this, then don't listen to anybody else. Key advice. Yeah. Thank you so much. That was so inspiring. And we're going to, I'm going to go ahead and see if we have any questions. Um, yeah, please. So we can Let's have people. See. Someone had asked about how many hours a week or how many hours do you work in a week in residency? And what does your average day look like? Oof, that's a really hard question to answer because every day is so different. It really depends if we're at the Heinz VA or at the Loyola. It really depends if you're a first year, second year, or third year. Um, I would say the first year and the second year were the most demanding just because the first and second year were primary call. So first year more than second year. I mean, obviously, we have rounding in the morning surgeries, clinic. Then at the end of the day, if you're still on call, then you cover the entire night. Usually our day starts anywhere between six to seven o'clock, sometimes earlier if you're like on off-service rotations. Um, and then the day usually ends around five, six. So it really depends. But usually a 10 to 12 hour day is like typical. On the days that you're on call, some days you get to the hospital at six and then you're done with your shift at 5 p.m. But then you're waiting for an add-on case to go on and then you get bumped and then you get bumped and then your case starts at 10 p.m. <laughs> and then your case ends okay. at 1 a.m. So yeah. it really depends on the day. Um, expect 10 to 12 hours a day. I think that's um, like a reasonable estimate. And yeah. then there's, at our program, we try to make it really fair where the call schedule is split up, where every resident usually is on call one weekend a month. So the three out of the four weekends, you're free. Um, and I really think it's important to go somewhere and pick a program where they take life balance into consideration and they give you that option to, you know, you're only going to be on call one weekend a, a month and then the rest of the weekends are off. You have something to look forward to in, in terms of scheduling things in your personal life as well. Okay. All right. So I don't want to take too much of your time. We're already a little bit over. Um, any other questions? Let's any, see. Yeah, I didn't see, I don't know. I didn't see any other questions. Um, but I did want to go ahead and remind everyone that we have one more week left for the Medi Things giveaway. 
Um, we do have our Fall Into Fitness and Family campaign going on right now. It's going to go on all season long. So go ahead and get those posts in, hashtag at PodMed Adventures. Go ahead and follow um, all three of us for that MediPins giveaway. And then if you wanted to say anything to wrap up, and thank you so much for, for Thank you so much for having today. me. Um, all I can say is just work hard, take care of other people, um, have the self-awareness and just believe in yourself that you can do things and don't listen to other people if they're negative. Stay, protect your energy and protect your time. Don't waste your time loving people that don't need your love. Don't waste your time doing things that don't impact other people or yourself. Um, and don't let other people's perspective or opinion dictate what you do because I did when it came to picking my clerkships and to this day I'm like why did I let this person dictate what I wanted to do so follow yeah. your instincts and I think that'll definitely take you further than you think awesome. thank you so much you're awesome Tina wants to say <laughs> bye too bye, oh, you look bye awesome. everybody bye <laughs> she was on my lap this whole time <laughs> Oh, and then okay, if anybody bye. else, I'm just going to say this. If anybody else has any questions, please feel free to DM me on Instagram or email me. All my information is on my page, so please don't hesitate. That's it. Hi. I'm going to stop talking so everyone can enjoy the rest of their Sunday. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, guys. Bye.